let me warn in advance of the limitations that will attend this presentation of a theological response to AI. There are many limitations. Uh, my treatment will be, in one respect, very one-sided, and I will say a word about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. But I'm acutely aware of this limitation. You could say that the really pressing question in relation to AI for theologians or Christians should be the same as it is for human beings outside any religious tradition or in other religious traditions. The really pressing question has to do with war and the impact of artificial intelligence on the conduct of war, lethal autonomous weapons systems, for example. I admit that that, and not only that, is a most important uh, aspect to deal with in relation to war. And in, in not pursuing that, I'm not demeaning it. I simply want to take a slightly broader look at AI. So please bear in mind that I'm not neglecting uh, the urgency of that particular issue. If we're going to consider AI broadly, what is meant by that? Many of you will know that forms of AI and definitions of AI vary. Many people who work in the area of AI don't regard the terminology AI, artificial intelligence, as particularly felicitous or helpful. But I, I'm going to deal with what goes under the name of AI. As is sometimes said, or often said actually, by people working in that area, practitioners in AI have thought of defining what they're up to in operational terms rather than theoretical terms, rather than exploring what intelligence really means, which is often thought of as a task for philosophers, uh, rather than for, for computer scientists, for example. Often in AI, people operate with the idea that artificial intelligence is an entity which is able to do things which, if done by people, would require intelligence. That is a kind of working understanding what's going on. <clears throat> and I shall be, I shall be looking at it uh, in that light. So I'm not concerned with definition of intelligence any more than many people are who are working in that area. But what I will be doing is concentrating rather on what is called uh, strong or general AI uh, rather than weak or narrow AI. Some of what I say may apply to weak or narrow AI, but it won't necessarily apply to that. By weak or narrow AI, terms vary here, but what we mean roughly is artificial intelligence, which is engineered for certain tasks and purposes, which are limited. Strong or general AI is engineering, which at least aspires to get machines to operate at human level intelligence. And around this, there's a lot of controversy. And it's that kind of AI which I shall have in mind, whether or not it's achieved or achievable, there's a way of thinking here about humans and about intelligence, which it's important for us in theology, as outside theology, I think, to grapple with. Now, <clears throat> I do want to retain the sense of urgency which we get when we consider military AI. And there's a lot of talk at the moment, of course, of the risks posed by AI and a call to pause AI research because of fears that AI can, will, and is beginning to de develop capabilities beyond our ability to fathom or control. While we are often ignorant, not only of what AI can do, but how it does what it can do, I want to reflect that urgency uh, without nevertheless concentrating on the application of AI in any particular area. What kind of broad considerations do I want to introduce? Well, 
I think a good place to start is a volume uh, written by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, who used to be CEO of Google, and Daniel Huttenlocker, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Schwartzman College of Computing, a volume they wrote called The Age of Artificial Intelligence, The Age of AI, which came out a couple of years ago. Now, these three authors vary a bit in the degree of optimism or pessimism they have about AI, but they all focus on a challenge. And <clears throat> there is, if not a worry, and perhaps there is a worry, there's certainly a lot of sobriety in their tone when they focus on this challenge. <laughs> the challenge is this, that artificial intelligence is overthrowing the hegemony, the, the leadership of reason, which since the Enlightenment has been what humans have prized. I quote them here, choice based on reason has been the defining attribute of humanity. Artificial intelligence of the kind I'm, I have in mind, I'm dealing with, knows things which humans not only do not, but also cannot know. When Alpha Zero, artificial intelligence, plays chess, it not only defeats uh, other machines and humans, it also plays chess, and here I'm simply reproducing what Kissinger and his colleagues say, it also plays chess in a different dimension. It makes some impossibly bizarre moves in our dimension. It certainly didn't learn any of those moves from humans. It was simply taught the objective and the rules of chess and does the strangest things. Chess in a different dimension, say chess masters. Again, when artificial intelligence, I'm still following here, tracking their discussion, when artificial intelligence undertook a hitherto unsuccessful human search for an antibiotic to kill bacteria strains, it spotted molecular attributes which exceed the capacity of the human mind to spot still less attributes that humans had actually encoded at all. It identified molecular relationships that might be humanly indescribable, let alone humanly detectable. So they say, AI forces us to posit a knowable realm out there, but not knowable by humans. Human reason can never access it. AI, which can and does access it, operates on terms that transcend reason. Now, the worry they have is this, or the concern they have is this, that we have come to view reason as the pinnacle of who we are. So if this is happening with AI, we have to rethink who we are, and not just rethink the role of reason. AI changes our experience of reality very drastically. I quote them again, Human perception and experience filtered through reason has long defined our understanding of reality. They say, end quote, they say that AI has done what previous technologies have not done, which is to change our experience so radically that how we, quote, humans understand reality and our role within it, end quote, is transformed. Now, our authors are not troubled by comparative uh, perceptual deficits, that is, bats or bears tuned into sonic frequencies uh, outside our range, that doesn't trouble them. Reason outdone is the problem they have. Those who adhere to the conviction that God knows things that humans in this life cannot know are not likely to be spiritually phased by the thought that there might be an order of created reality which may be beyond our capacity to know in human flesh. Now, perhaps nothing in religious believers' view of reason causes believers a priori from the outset to suspect the kind of limits on human reason which AI has disclosed to be the case in relation to the created order. Still, um, we are surely not emotionally observe, uh, averse sorry, to or spiritually find disturbing the possibility that there are constitutionally elusive molecular, molecular relationships. Now, 
I admit that in saying that I may be betraying the fact that I'm not a scientist. And I grant to the need to reckon with the description of the human being forcefully put out there in modern theology by, for example, Bernard Lonergan, when he talks of human beings as borne along by the pure desire to know everything there is to be known. I want to allow for that. Still, I stick to my unfazed routine here, and I think many of us will. Translated into the idiom of AI, God is a conscious, uncreated superintelligence. And uncreated marks the distinction between God and AI most conspicuously, because some involved in AI hold that the creation of a conscious, conscious intelligence or superintelligence is conceivable. I, I should say that for the sake of simplicity, and only for the sake of simplicity, uh, I shall have Christian theology principally in mind when I talk about theology. Not that other theologies are unimportant or any such thing. It's simply that different theologies in different religious traditions will come at this differently, and they can't all be encompassed in a single uh, talk like this. So I would want to say in Christian perspective, even though others may share this perspective who are not Christian, that where reason is humbled in Christian theology, humbled in saying that there are things it may never know, that is the function of belief in God. And when I talk about reason being humbled, I don't mean uh, that humans grovel before their creator or lack a sense of self-worth, because unfortunately when people talk about humbling, they often uh, fear that uh, they're going to be understood as groveling or something. So let's just get that out of the way. Now, <clears throat> in the context of this volume, On the Age of AI, it certainly would be fruitful to discuss the theological significance of knowing. Uh, that's a discussion which obviously requires investigation of what knowing means if we attribute it to AI. And that would lead us to ponder how AI partakes of modernity's reduction of knowledge to information, or of what is sometimes called instrumental rationality, a rationality designed for a certain specific end. But although I think discussing that is important, I want to take a different route out of uh, the volume by Kissinger and company, because they say something interesting and significant here, which as theologians we must ponder, as Christians we must ponder, adjusting to artificial intelligence, our authors propose that, and I quote them here, to make sense of our place in this world, our emphasis may need to shift from the centrality of human reason to the centrality of human dignity and autonomy. They don't advocate a transhuman solution to our vanquished reason. They don't say, let's pump up human reason transhumanly. They don't say that. Now, they don't develop their proposal, uh, but when they speak in those, the, those terms, it invites a theological reflection, which we might in any case say could have been invited, even if we hadn't taken a route through this particular volume. But it's good to to respond theologically, I think, to a volume such as this and not simply follow a theological agenda in its own right, as it were. In other words, the book nicely places before us certain theological issues. Okay, so the centrality of human dignity and autonomy, that must now be our emphasis instead of reason. Now, Descartes, who will come up later, and which sometimes seems to come up everywhere in discussion of this and cognate issues. Descartes sounded the modern note when he gave human reason its central place in the 17th century, precisely because reason is the epistemological expression, our capacity to know by reason is the epistemological expression of a spiritual autonomy and that spiritual autonomy constitutes human dignity. So when you read Descartes, you find that actually dignity does lie at the bottom of it. Dignity is preserved through autonomy. Autonomy is exercised through reason. And 
it's, it's most interesting in this light to ask what Descartes would have said had he witnessed uh, Gary Kasparov, then world chess champion, when he was defeated by the computer, Deep Blue. And uh, Kasparov said, uh, either before that first game or in a rematch, uh, he said, I'm here to defend our dignity. And by our, he meant our human dignity. Now, whatever the shape of a dignity and autonomy that survive AI's exposure of the limits of reason. I'm not sure that theology has anything to say about autonomy in relation to AI that has not been said about autonomy in other contexts. Though I do want to make this one remark that we should always consider autonomy in theology in the light of disability and ask, therefore, what is presupposed in that light about embodiment and about intelligence in the ideal of artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to pursue autonomy because I don't think there's anything fresh to be said here necessarily. I want to take up here some work by Robert Son uh, in the University of Durham. And he makes much of the question of dignity when he is examining AI theologically. What Robert Son does is to discourage a defense of human dignity. He does this as a theologian. He wants to discourage a defense of human dignity in light of AI that takes the form of defending human uniqueness. He doesn't want to defend human uniqueness in order to defend human dignity. As far as he's concerned, if intelligent machines threaten human uniqueness, that does not mean they threaten human dignity. Human dignity doesn't consist in the possession of distinctive characteristics. This is his argument, of course, I'm describing here. It is dignity, not uniqueness, we should be worrying about with AI because the philosophy undergirding AI is prone to downgrading human dignity. It is the philosophy of naturalism. For naturalism, matter is only that, matter. So human beings are mere matter. Human dignity properly consists in the fact that we are not mere matter. As such, we have a human vocation. And that vocation is a stamp of our God-given dignity. And we are not robbed of that dignity because we are not robbed of that vocation by the possibility that we can't specify characteristics such as intelligence that makes us unique. So that's his argument. I take it that's relatively clear. Now I, I go along with much in Robert Song's observations on the naturalistic assumptions that characterize philosophies which typically undergird AI. But I must part company with this argument of his. I agree we should not be proceeding a priori, as it were, with a relatively abstract or theologically untested kind of presumption that human dignity is only protected if we protect human uniqueness. I accept that as a general axiom we don't want to defend that. But if we believe that the book of Genesis affords us theological guidance today, if we take that position, we find there, of course, that humankind is in the image of God. Only humankind is in the image of God. And if we import the language of dignity into the text there in order to do some theological work for us, we'll surely say that the dignity of human being does reside in what uniquely characterizes it. Even if uh, humans incorporate, or human dignity rather, incorporates elements shared with the animal and even wider creation. If we incorporate the understanding which Genesis has of humankind into our theology, then AI compels humankind to forfeit its claim to uniqueness only if AI is also in the image of God. Or 
if AI possesses some characteristic which, which leaves humans unique, but somehow changes the significance of the uniqueness. As, for example, people might say, well, the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligences may leave humans unique in some way, but that uniqueness somehow does not seem to lend particular dignity to them. Someone may say that, theoretically. So I want to pursue this. There are two questions that arise here. The first is, does a definite dogmatic interpretation of the phrase the image of God underlie uh, what I've said about the image of God and uniqueness? Do I have to be sure what Janice is saying before I make the claim that it's a claim to uniqueness and that that constitutes part of human dignity? The second question is, could not AI possess the image of God? If not, does it possess some characteristic or characteristics which make an appeal to human dignity, grounded in human uniqueness, something which doesn't really have much force? Now, I want to answer both questions, no. That is, I want to say that what follows does not depend on a dogmatic interpretation of the phrase the image of God or its theological usefulness. And I want to say no, that AI cannot possess the image of God or some characteristic which robs the image of God of its peculiar dignity in the created order. That's what I want to do. So let me start along this path with uh, remarks on an early, and maybe the first, substantial book on artificial intelligence from a theological perspective, which came out. That's Noreen Hertzfeld's book, In Our Image. And uh, she pursues the question of what it is that has driven people to create AI whose goal she describes as being to create an other in our own image. And she detects parallels between the major historical interpretations of the phrase the image of God and the reasons for creating AI in the image of humans. She thinks there are parallels there. So she identifies in that book three major interpretations of the meaning of the image of God. In Genesis, it has been understood as something a substantial. Humans are intelligent or rational. It has been understood as b something functional. Humans have the gift and the responsibility of dominion. It's been understood c as something relational. The image of God is a relationship between humans and God, and humans. Have one human being and other humans. Now, what she says is this. In devising artificial intelligence in the image of humans, the substantial, functional, and relational have all featured. We have sought to make an entity, first, with the property of intelligence, the substantial aspect, or, secondly, an entity capable of performing certain tasks, that corresponds to the functional aspect of the image of God. Thirdly, we've, thought, we've sought to create an entity which, to which we can relate and perhaps can relate to us, the relational aspect. Or maybe we create AI with some combination of the above. The point is that these three ways of thinking of AI in the image of, image of humans interestingly reflects three major ways in which humans have been thought to be in the image of God in the Christian tradition. And she returns to all this briefly in the second volume, which came out earlier this year in 2023, called The Artificial, The Artifice, sorry, The Artifice of Intelligence, where she characterizes the creation of AI in our image in corresponding terms of mirror or servant or friend. Now, it's an interesting 
thesis indeed by an author very well trained in both computer science and theology and mathematics as a matter of fact. But there is an interesting omission in this thesis because there is a fourth view of the image that has been historically influential, one adopted by many in the Protestant tradition, which interprets the image as a moral quality, moral excellence. To be in the image of God is to be righteous, so we could call it a religious as well as a moral quality. Now, my interest at the moment is less in the fact that Hertzfeld omits mention of this than the fact that if she had reckoned with this fourth view, she would not easily have found a parallel with the creation of AI in the image of humankind. There is talk of moral AI and of religious AI, but we shall scarcely find the production of moral excellence, still less of moral excellence before God or holiness. We shall scarcely find that a prominent motivation in the history of the creation of AI, even if there is a moral component uh, ingredient in the substance of intelligence, the function of dominion, in a more foregrounded way in relationships. Yes, there's going to be moral quality in there, but you don't create the AI for the sake of the being of moral, still less religious quality. Now, we don't have to interpret here dogmatically the image of God. We don't have to interpret in one of these four ways and we don't even have to say it has got to be one of those four ways. Those are four traditional ways anyway. They may all be wrong. We don't have to interpret it dogmatically in order to appreciate the significance of <coughs> her omission in an account of AI. Because the generic capacity for moral agency, which is integral to the religious relationship to God, which God has established with the human creature, is biblically and theologically at the heart of human dignity. Not only is such a capacity not essential to AI, it doesn't have to be a moral agent in that sense. I want to say it's not even possible. It is a truism. We're all familiar with the fact that Christians think of the religious relationship between God and humans in both generic and in particular terms, generic in that humankind is constituted for that relationship, particular in that the, the relationship of discrete individuals to God is constituted variously in the various relationships God has with individuated human creatures. Humankind is incapable of creating AI that has this relationship. We do not have a clue how it could be done generically. We can't engineer this and have no clue.